um, kind of business item. So um, thanks for coming to the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health Lecture Series. And this will be the final lecture for the um, 2019 spring semester. So we'll pick up in the fall. And unless you hear otherwise, we get some great opportunity to have a speaker come in this summer. We'll let you know. Um, and then, um, yeah, so at this point, I'm going to turn the formal introduction duties over to Phil Adis, our local cardiac rehab expert. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So I'm very pleased to introduce my, my friend, Dan Foreman, who's a professor of geriatrics and cardiology at the University of Pittsburgh. And he's also a national figure uh, in cardiac rehab. To review his bio a bit, he went to Brown undergraduate, George Washington Med School, did his residency at Tufts, and then a fellowship in geriatrics at Harvard, then a fellowship in cardiology at, was it Beth Israel? Mm -hmm. Okay, also at Harvard. And then he's had a number of jobs, seems to Early on, moved every five years, spent five years at Brown, five years at Boston University, uh, then was at the Brigham at Harvard for 10 years, directed their exercise lab in cardiac rehab, and now has been at the University of Pittsburgh since 2014, and I think he's going to stay unless, unless someone lures him with a chief job, and I've advised him against that. <laughs> of course, it sometimes impacts on your research. Uh, he has almost 200 peer-reviewed publications, most at the intersection of cardiology and geriatrics, and very importantly, looks at endpoints of uh, and studies uh, comorbidities, disability, uh, measures of frailty, heart failure, polypharmacy, and cardiac rehab in the elderly, with a focus on patient-centered outcomes. Um, he's currently funded. He has two R01s. Uh, one is uh, called Macro which uh, means Modified Application of Cardiac Rehabilitation in Older Adults. And he's the PI. It's a two-center uh, study with the University of Pittsburgh and Washington University in St. Louis. And key to this is that cardiac rehab in the elderly, he feels, should be individualized, and you should have patients define outcomes. What is it that they want to see, or what is it that they want to reach in cardiac rehab? And it's a combination of on-site and a hybrid model and some home cardiac rehab in it. Really exciting study that I'm looking forward. I'm on the DSMB, so I get to follow along with it. Uh, he's got another R01 that looks at physiologic responses, uh, muscle biochemistry to exercise training. Uh, so he has lots of, lots of research support. Um, and I won't take up any more time, so it's really. Oh, lastly, uh, we're giving you a copy of the locally written Eating Well, Healthy Heart Cookbook for yourself and your wife. And Thank thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I really want to acknowledge Phil Edis because he's been a role model. Um, my career is a little bit circuitous, um, as you kind of heard. I mean, there's strengths to that. People often talk about the value of kind of being expansive, but it also dilutes you. And some, I think my career has become much stronger in the last five years because I have really combined many of my interests in doing geriatrics and cardiology. And so I, and I really want to emphasize that you all should be geriatricians because your patients are old. <laughs> and I think it's an expertise that I think is really incumbent on us who are caring for patients in 2019 and the years to come to think about. So I'm going to talk about behavioral and clinical approaches uh, that are consistent with our, our demographics. So I, I really emphasize demographics. I just alluded to them. I just want to be a little bit more substantive just quickly to say that the numbers of people that are older is they're, it's skyrocketing. And you know this. You walk into any office, you walk into your hospitals, this, you see older people. Population to 65 and over in America is soon to be about one-fifth over 65. That's true all over the world. It's true in China. It's true in India. Industrialized, non-industrialized countries, people are living longer. Don't, it's not the baby boomers. It's that the baby boomers are there, but they're living longer. That's a huge shift. So whereas the average length of life in much of the world was 55 or younger in 1900, now it's about 80 and over in much of the world. The population 85 and over is the largest demographic in the world, 85 and over. So you think about that. Think of the 85-year-olds you know 
and all the associated uh, frailties, complexities, multimorbidities, this is normal. This is not exceptional. So this is the point where I, this drives my career and it drives the sense of passion that I feel, that this is the norm. And our, we have a health system, as I see it, that is completely unprepared for this. We do not know how to house people. We do not know how to talk to people. We do not know how to provide informed consent for a population that has the needs uh, that we are now gonna be treating. And this is the drive through the lens of a cardiologist that I see it, who gets cardiac disease. It is not 50-year-old men giving a lecture in a boardroom. You see that classic picture of the man clutching his chest. It is older women and men, women outlive men. They're the most vulnerable to having cardiac disease in their older age. These are not epidemiological data. They are biological data, and that's becoming more and more clear. One of the reasons I am happy in Pittsburgh is because the institution has, developed, has invested a huge amount of money, probably more than $50 million in the last year or two, in geroscience. So geroscience is basically saying, just as we have this tremendous preoccupation about the molecular determinants of cardiovascular disease and every other disease, geroscience is saying aging is not just passive, it's molecular. What is happening to cells to make them suddenly change and be more, vulnerability, more vulnerable to changes in cognition, to muscle, to these concepts of frailty, and we can study those. It has to do with genes and epigenetics. It has to do with mitochondria and how the cells work. It has to do with, with uh, the protein folding, with proteostasis. So these are predictable, and they can potentially be modifiable. So if you think about what pharma's kind of focused on now and what well, people all over the world, it's how do you modify an aging demographic. So one model is to make people potentially live longer. That, to me, is less interesting to make than making people live better. How, how can you change some of the patterns of aging? So this is all summarized in this study by Lakata. I, I happen to like this slide, so I don't I dwell on it perhaps excessively, but it looks at age on the x-axis, and it says that as you live longer, you're vulnerable to these predominant patterns, which are this big uh, arrow in the middle, this white arrow. And the little wavy lines are meant to depict homeostasis. So people, everyone in this room, everyone in the world, has their own resistance to some of these predominant patterns. But because of all of these, the um, different mechanisms of aging, which you see in the schematic on the left, ultimately everyone is vulnerable to the onset of disease. But it's not just one disease. It's not that one heart attack for the 50-year-old man. It's multiple diseases. Multimorbidity is endemic if you are lucky enough to live longer. And on top of that, this is what Lakata really kind of tried to champion, is this, this disease-independent phenomenon on top of disease, of frailty. You don't have to have diseases to be frail, but if you have multiple diseases in old age, you're more vulnerable to having this notion of frailty, which is conceptually kind of intuitive, but very hard to define. What is frailty? What makes somebody who's frail different? But I would argue that you need to be thinking about this because this is endemic in the people, the people that we're treating. And I, I harp on this picture. So this is Bernie Sanders and Barbara Walters back in 2015 when he was running for president the first time. And, uh, or, and as part of the, the, the conversation, they're, they're, they're on TV, and they're, they're, there they are, talking away. And was it really relevant to you listening, whether you like them or not, that one was 75 and one was 87? Probably not. I mean, you think about their ideas and who they are, but the fact is this is trying to impress upon you that people are living longer. The average 75-year-old has, on the average, 10 years of life in front of him or her. The average 90-year-old has, on the average, five years of life him in front of her. So it's not enough to say, oh, you know, dearie, it's not going to hurt too much. You know, it's, it's really, these are very, these are complicated people who we treat one way when we see them perhaps on TV or in some other forum, but we treat very differently when they're in the hospital. And for me, in my experience, in my career doing geriatrics and cardiology, I've been in debates with many people about issues related to this, and the people I'm debating are very passionate about what they believe is the right medical choice until you talk about what they do for their parents or their grandparents. And then it all falls apart because all of the complexities I've referred to already start to creep in, and the answers are very rarely black and white. So multimorbidity, we mentioned the word. So if we look at all the cardiac, these are CDC data. And we see that if you look at cardiac diseases, chronic diseases in the Medicare population, they're all associated with multimorbidity. Heart failure, average heart failure patient has five or more comorbidities. So when you have Clyde Yancey or other pundits of heart failure say, push the ACE inhibitor, push the Entresto, I would say you're, 
I don't agree with that because they're missing the boat of the fact that there's comorbidities that are also relevant. And driving down the blood pressure or doing other things that may exacerbate COPD or other problems really will not be doing that patient a favor. So it's the complexity of multimorbidity. This is work by a geriatrician, um, Mary Tonetti, who talks about activities of daily living in, in the context of multimorbidity. And so if you see, if you have heart failure alone, your ability to do activities of daily living is diminished. COPD alone, activities of daily living is diminished. You put them together, it's this synergistic effect that she talks about. Multimorbidity drives down impairment. And it's not really in any of our medical models. It's, it goes beyond our traditional medical thought process. She talks about this with heart failure and depression and all of these combinations, these dyads. And she refers to the fact that it's even more complicated with triads and other combinations of multimorbidity. And we do not have a thought process about really what drives it, what's the right medicine, what pills to push, and it's inherently complicated. The new heart failure pill, you know, get with the guidelines. I mentioned Clyde Yanti, he's a big pundit or big proponent of the guidelines. And I, I admire him, he's brilliant. But, you know, so is it hard to take to treat heart failure when somebody has a dyad, like hypertension. Cardiologists will laugh at me if I said this. Of course they know how to take care of heart failure and hypertension. They can even take care of heart failure with hypertension with AFib. This is a common combination. These pills are not that complicated, most cardiologists would argue, to taking care of this. But this is the multimorbidity that I would say that cardiologists really don't know how to take care of because the polypharmacy really is inherent to this issue. So which pill is the right pill? And how much should the cardiologist be worrying about anemia and should be worrying about bleeding and depression and all these other things that can be inadvertently exacerbated? So this notion of the right pill for the right disease misses the point that the right pill really may not be the right in the context of the overall complexity. And then I've mentioned frailty and people argue about how to measure frailty, what is frailty, and I'm sure many of you have seen this picture. It's kind of used as the poster child of uh, poster board of, of what frailty. These people don't look normal. What about them? Is it something about their gaze, their body composition? And people argue, as I've said, how do you measure this? Is it gait speed? Is it something else? So there's this kind of theoretical definition, this notion of declines across multiple physiological systems with the assumption that there's a diminished uh, capacity to tolerate stresses and diminished or increased vulnerability to bad outcomes. So if you don't treat these people if they have heart failure, they're gonna do worse because they're frail. And if you do treat them because they have heart failure, they may do worse because they're frail. You're kind of between a rock and a hard place. So I would say these people look frail. Which one of these people is frail? So, so we talk about the eyeball test, but that's very hard to kind of just look at somebody and always know for certain who's frail, who's not. Should we be pushing the meds? Should we be not? Should they have the procedure? Should they not? Because, and then go back to the demographics. This is not esoteric. This is mainstream medicine. This is every patient in your waiting room that, that has these kind of issues. So people have tried to figure out how to measure frailty. I'm sure most people have heard this, this uh, Linda Freed phenotype frailty. So she looked at a database and she did regression analysis. And so she said, based upon that regression analysis and the things that she looked at, that slowness and weakness and shrinking and inactivity and exhaustion define frailty. A phenotype, she did this in 2001 and we still talk about it now and people have been arguing about it for close to 20 years, but this was a landmark article. And the reason why it's endured is that she and really the other people behind her, John Hopkins, Jeremy Walsh in particular, have spent their whole career then going down to say, what is this frailty? And it goes back to that picture from what I mentioned with Lakata and the geroscience. It goes down to something biologic. And they talk about in this schematic that there's inflammation and there's uh, changes of hormones and there's insulin resistance that's really determining these downstream effects. It's exacerbated usually by changes of nutrition that's been really factored in. No, no, don't know quite how to respond to that yet, but what, how to supplement nutrition. And it overlaps with diseases because these same inflammatory mechanisms really in many cases drive coronary heart disease and drive other elements of heart disease. So people who are prone to frailty are prone to cardiac disease and these things really tend to compound on themselves. So there's patterns. We don't really quite know how to address them. And what's made this issue even more complicated is that this notion of frailty as being somehow separate from disease, separate from disability is a very freed-like concept. She sees this as very biological and has been championed, as I mentioned, by many people subsequently. And it contrasts with others. I'm just gonna go, I'll go to this. This is a, a, a work by uh, Ken Rockwood, 
who sees frailty in a completely different way. He sees frailty in terms of an accumulation of deficits. So he doesn't lump this biological frailty as something separate from comorbidity. He sees them all together. So Rockwood, as many of you have known, has written probably 200 articles just about this one topic. And they're all kind of super articles, very compelling, and talks about many different scoring systems of deficits. And there's been many people who have championed this in the surgical world, and they have their own versions of how to best look at uh, frailty, looking at a deficit of a, uh, a, an accumulation of deficits. Totally different in concept and construct than the Freed, who Freed says you can measure this in your office, and Rockwood says you can measure this from the chart, and, and they, they're really incompatible in many ways. And these people have argued. So geriatricians, many people say, oh, they're nice people. This is combative. And they, this has led to many different arguments all over the world where people have argued, how do you measure frailty? This is one of many consensus efforts by Matteo Cesare where he said, well, they're both important. The, the phenotype's important because you can measure in your office. You can measure it in cardiac rehab. Potentially, it's actionable. And then there's other people who have said the Rockwoodian model's better because you can characterize people throughout the country, like they're doing this in England now. Uh, Andy Clegwood has, has, has really changed the entire structure of British health systems to based on how frail people are. So people have, uh, Andrew Clegg, excuse me. So people have really argued about how to use these both and how to use them both as, as compatible with each other. I want to go back to, excuse me if I can. I just want to go back. Yeah, good, good. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to go back to this picture. This is work that I did when I got to Pittsburgh um, with Ann Newman. Uh, we looked at the Health ABC study. So Health ABC was pretty healthy people in their 70s when they were enrolled. And they're followed, in this case, for six years with yearly DEXA scans. So super healthy people followed with this body composition assessment over time. And we looked at the people who had incident heart failure over that time. So I want to highlight the fact that we looked at these changes of lean body mass, looking at really skeletal muscle mass, and showing that after people developed heart failure, the lean body mass felt precipitously, particularly appendicular lean mass, which is really used as one of the more sensitive markers. And really to highlight the fact that when one talks about heart failure, this change of body composition and all the associated determinants that it has in terms of frailty, in terms of uh, vulnerability to falls, in terms of inability to tolerate some of the hemodynamic changes that we, we routinely uh, uh, initiate on patients are all very much at play. So it, it's not part of the Clyde Yancey or the other people who push guidelines thought process, but it's such a powerful part of their care. So I kind of see frailty in terms of the, the free-like model, thinking about these <laughs> dimensions of care as being, as, as being so... Uh, I'm sorry about this. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop using this, this, but I can't get this to go away. Here we go. Okay, I'm just going to use this for here and Thanks. So let me just jump in to emphasize the take-home points that frailty is hard to measure, and yet it's clinically very relevant. This work by Tom Gill, another geriatrician, showing that when one is frail, no matter what we do, the right pill, the right procedure, the surgeon's happy that what he or she did. Everyone thinks they did a great job. When someone is frail, they do not do well. Their ability to go home and be functional it really is very rarely the case, especially when one is older. So it's frailty is not age, but it's overlaps with aging, vulnerability of older patients. This is another piece by Tom Gill. This is a key point that when someone goes to the hospital, they very rarely get back to where they were before they went to the hospital. This is a common experience. They go back, they go, ho they go home, everyone says you did great, but their recovery is really suboptimal. And you're vulnerable because of that to being re-hospitalized into a vicious cycle with, with each re-hospitalization, their progressive disability accumulates. And, and in this case, it culminates in death. So it's a huge phenomenon, and it's really endemic with our population getting older. So of our paradigm of care, of excellence, of the surgeons, of the right medicines, the procedure-oriented uh, culture of, of cardiology really promotes quality. We have this, this notion of evidence-based rationale, but I would really argue it's based upon a subset of patients that are not the common patients that we treat who are older, frail, or complex with multimorbidity. 
polypharmacy and other problems. And if you put in these patients, no matter what you did in that procedure, I would argue the outcomes are much less likely to be optimal. And you ask patients what, what they want, they very rarely say they want the best procedure. They, they really want to go back to a quality of life that meant the most to them. These were data that were collected in, in the government in trying to talk about patient preferred outcomes. And what patient was, re, what, what the, the consensus was that function was really one of the biggest priorities of care for most people being treated for cardiac disease and non-cardiac disease. You know, staying out of the hospital, staying sharp, playing with my children. This is not consistent necessarily with beta blockers, with statins, with other things that we would push as routine. And the recovery from surgery is very rarely thought about as part of what people are, are uh, anticipating, the, the, the slow progression and perhaps inadequate progression towards recovery. So we talked about these, these gaps where, where the uh, patients are on one side, the clinicians are on the other, and there's a lot of frustration because each one has thought that they had expectations, the clinicians that they did the right job, patients should be happy, and the patients not necessarily happy. And I would argue this is, these are all in, you know, uh, in, in essentially the, the, der the derivatives of the fact we have evidence-based care based upon one model, we have patient outcomes which are very different because the patients have changed, and we have all of these issues of the goals of care is changing with aging, people are concerned about function, not their EF, not their BNP necessarily, the co comorbidities, all these aging phenomenon, the changes of nutrition, perhaps compounded by changes of teeth and swallowing and absorption, changes of the microbiome, all relevant towards what patients are experiencing, and the overall re uh, capacity to recover is diminished. So this is what I think we all face as behavioralists or as uh, clinicians of any sort. I would say that we have an aging society prone to multimorbidity and complexity. So in Pittsburgh, uh, I'm very aware, with Bob Arnold as one of the champions of palliative care, that palliative care has come on like gangbusters because it responded to some of these things. It said, oh, you cardiologist, yeah, you think you know what you're doing, but I'm gonna speak to the patients, I'm gonna be brilliant in my language capacity with my patients, and people flock to that. Palliative care is seen as like the best thing in the world because it responds to this gap of care. Then we have a competing sense from the proceduralists. So you have uh, many people who do surgery say, if you tell me about surgery, we'll do something, we'll get these patients, we'll, we'll use shorter uh, time on the pump, shorter whatever, we'll do it better. And we'll deal with frailty in our own way, we know it. So it's kind of a very gestalty kind of approach. And then you have people like me that say, this is an opportunity for thinking about prehabilitation perhaps in new ways, rehabilitation, and really trying to, uh, and prevention in ways that are very topical and trying to respond to these challenges. The one thing I would really want to say is that we don't really know what the right answers are for which patients. We're, this is a, a work in progress. To me, the biggest thing that perhaps we could do to this afternoon is share decision making. Much better, and this is a, a, a big RFA, this is a big effort to try to invigorate the notion of informed, uh, of shared decisions with patients in ways that are a little bit more uh, responsive to limitations of cognition, uh, responsive to the fact that one disease is usually not the, the reality, it's multiple diseases, and trying to make things more visual, trying to things more conceptual, that even people that are impaired visually, uh, visually cognitively, hearing-wise, could still have a basis of understanding. This is just meant to show one demonstration dealing with anticoagulation. Shared decision-making is being integrated more and more into the guidelines, and I've been very involved with the statin guidelines. Shared decision-making is, is, is everywhere in that guideline, but it's true in so many others. You can't have an ICD. You can't uh, think about using uh, various d d devices for the um, uh, atrial fibrillation without having shared decision-making as part of evidence-based medicine anymore. So that's really very topical. But I also want to characterize what's going on in terms of opportunities for uh, rehabilitation and prevention in general. And I want to highlight the fact that TAVR really changed the world for, for cardiologists. So TAVR, as many of you know, is this, this notion that you could take, instead of having open heart surgery to replace a heart valve, suddenly you can replace a heart valve by putting it in through a catheter, through your leg usually, in a procedure where some people can go home even the same day in Canada, but usually within a day or two people can go home because you haven't overwhelmingly uh, altered the body's physiology with, with the procedure itself. Who gets aortic stenosis? Who needs a TAVR? It's older people. It's, a, it's one of the, the, the many manifestations of the aging physiology, changes of our genes that make us more vulnerable to having the stenotic valve, a rock-like valve, so that all your blood is squeezing through this valve, and you're basically going to die if you don't treat it, and the only treatment up until about 10 years ago was having surgery for which people were considered too frail, so they did die. Suddenly, suddenly, people could intervene on frail people because we had technology that allowed us to do their surgery uh, in spite of the frailty, not, a, not surgery, but this, this, this alternative to surgery called TAVR, a, a catheter 
uh, base procedure. So these are old data, but I really highlight a very important uh, phenomenon that we're still dealing with to this afternoon and every other day this week that you're taking care of your patients. The graph on your left are old data. It's talking about that first year in the big landmark trial in America, they looked at the, uh, the uh, partner's data and it looked at older people, mean ages in, the early, in their early 80s, uh, too sick for surgery, and they had TAVRs, and about a third died in the first year. And most TAVR people would say, we do a lot better than that now, much better than a third dying. But the other two graphs haven't changed, and it talks about functional changes with New York Heart Association classification and quality of life changes with Casey, the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. And in both cases, 50% of the people improved after this very expensive procedure, state-of-the-art, wonderful. All the procedurals are patting themselves on the back. Outcomes are great. Half the people get improvement, half don't. So this embedded frailty is not so easy to overcome. And just putting in a new valve is not so easy to overcome. And that's the challenge with every pill, with everything that we do. I think there's a lot of assumptions that we make about how good we're doing that may not be true. So it was kind of a paradigm shift. So I have really fixated in my career, kind of at the same time this was evolving, on this focus on function and talking, you know, a lot of work on cardiorespiratory fitness, which I think for many cardiologists was never really part of their main focus. They were so busy thinking about the pristine look of a, of a uh, artery that has been restenosed or the taver that's been well placed with a new valve. But function is really an integrated physiology with how the heart's working, with the lungs, with the, the uh, vasculature and the muscles to really allow us to have uh, capacity to, to be functional. And it, it's really one of the most important measures of how someone's going to do over time. These are just some of the many data. This is Jonathan Meyer's work that shows that another measure, one of the many measures of, of cardiorespiratory fitness in this case is looking at MET levels. It's an approximation of how much oxygen you're using per minute. And it shows that with people who are normal or the people who have cardiovascular disease, he's looked at this in young, uh, old, he's looked at various subgroups, that if you have a, a low cardiorespiratory fitness, you're really more vulnerable to mortality, to morbidity, to all kinds of bad outcomes. So one of the most potent ways of modifying this, people I'm sure you all think about, is, is exercising. So it sounds good. It's certainly if you're young, you can increase your cardiorespiratory fitness. There's lots been written about this. And even if you're older, this is a modifiable uh, work. There's been lots of work. Uh, John, John Halsey, uh, many others have written about this for, for many years. But go back to this notion of someone lying in his bed or her bed who's frail, who's low muscle mass. And you can say, and many of you probably have, go exercise. And it may sound good. It may make you feel good. But I think it's very daunting to the individual. They might not even understand what exercise means. What does it really mean conceptually to change this term cardiorespiratory fitness, what do these things mean and how is it going to be uh, useful? So I see cardiac rehab as one of the big opportunities for saying you are lying in bed, you're, you're recovering from the likelihood of having disease in the context of complexity, and how do we help you to recover by implementing a, a reimbursable part of our medical armamentarium with cardiac rehab? So this is work that, that Phil Aitis was, was a part of that I, I love this study. It looked at some Medicare data and looked at who uses cardiac rehab across America. And it really points out with the, the predominance of the lighter colors that very few older people go to cardiac rehab. So again, I'm going to go back to this, you know, the, the recapitulate. These are the most vulnerable population growing in, 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 in prevalence, most vulnerable to poor outcomes because of functional decline for whom, for which cardiac rehab is the best possible solution and based upon this notion of cardiorespiratory priorities. And who doesn't go to cardiac rehab? The older people. And I always like to point out Florida. You know, are there any old people in Florida with cardiac disease? And that is like less than 5% of use, ut utilization. Overall in the country, it was about 15% of older people. And I would argue these numbers have not really budged since, much since this time, although that really remains to be proven. But this, this study has not been repeated. But the uh, Indications for cardiac rehab have gone up without really a lot of incentives for older people who are still so impaired to get there and to really be functionally robust as a beneficiary of these kinds of applications. It's not true here in Vermont. I know your program is preeminent, and other cities have strong programs in exceptional circumstances. But overall, these patterns remain quite abysmal. And I think this is part of the problem. If you Google cardiac rehab, you do not see older people. You see people like this. You see young old, you might call them, are pretty youthful. I would say this is a middle-aged individual. 
and you see perky people and you see bright, you know, running on the treadmill, holding weights, and maybe you have patients like that. I mean, I think that the, this is a wonderful part of cardiac rehab to feel like these are people you're helping. Everyone's perky. But I think these are the patients that I see more routinely now, and I think they're, and even these are pretty um, uh, engaged or uh, uh, intact people because they live in the community that can get there even by van uh, to the VA hospital. But they, they really start to highlight the issues that I think are really important. That they don't usually have one disease. They have multiple cardiac diseases. They have multiple non-cardiac diseases. They have hearing impairments. They have visual impairments. They have balance impairments. And to just say, oh, go exercise is really hard for these people. So it's really, in, in Pittsburgh, we really had a chance to kind of think about this in ways that are uh, more and more informative to a, a new approach to care. So you heard a little bit about the fact we were, were funded um, about a year ago by the National Institute of Aging to look at cardiac rehab. And the whole basis of our application was along the lines of what I've descri described, that the demographics demand new thought processes, that the, the largest uh, demographic that underutilizes cardiac rehab uh, include this, this older, frail population for whom the benefits are so great. So this is kind of a busy slide, and I'm, just, I'm gonna emphasize the last bullet, but just to give you an overview, that we've really changed the whole concept of risk when we look at people who are coming into cardiac rehab because we integrate frailty. We do this with questionnaires. We use various uh, questionnaires for um, uh, frailty itself in, in uh, association with various functional measures to try to have a, a con uh, an aggregate sense of risk. It includes cognition. It includes uh, literacy. And we really try to say who is uh, likely to or who is the most uh, intact, who is the most vulnerable in terms of risk, and we look at uh, all of these components, the uh, frailty, psychosocial, cardiac, as composite measures. We care if someone lives alone. We care about the social supports um, of all sorts, uh, we, and we care deeply about functional measures. And then we, cut, we link that with our notion of what model of care. So within cardiac rehab world, as many of you may know, there's, there's a rising uh, pop, uh, interest in home-based cardiac rehab, and there's lots of proponents for this. And my feeling remains is, and it will be uh, demonstrated, I hope, with this project, that home care is great sometimes. It has to fit the person. And if you have somebody who is high risk and high frailty with learning impairment, and you say, do home care, home-based cardiac rehab, it's not likely to succeed. But if you tailor it, and you have a strategy that becomes generalizable, we feel like we can really target these things in ways that are more efficient, more patient-centered. So we're trying to prove that. And the other pillar of this uh, uh, grant is that we're really looking at the medications in aggregate, and we're saying we want you to take, be adherent to your cardiac medications, but we also want you to, to perhaps uh, remove dependencies on drugs that you don't need. So we're targeting particularly uh, medications that affect brain health things that are sedating, things that are potentially uh, confusing. So we have a list of specific drugs that I've worked out with my co-investigator, Eric Lynch, who's a psychiatrist, who's done a lot of work in this field of deprescribing. So we're expanding that into the cardiac rehab model for older people on multiple meds, trying to take away benzodiazepines, certain sleeping pills, and trying to really target this in concert with their own uh, personal doctors. And the third part, the, the last part, the fourth part, uh, with Eric Lentz, who is really, I'm going to talk about his work for a few moments, is that he, as a psychiatrist, has done uh, uh, many years where focusing on behavior changes in aging. And he's done work particularly in, in the, the seminal uh, studies that looked at motivating higher intensity uh, exercise in uh, long-term care facilities using a model of uh, theoretical self-determination, a Bandura-based uh, 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 learning uh, uh, approach in which he really emphasizes this notion of goal setting and uh, progress tracking as a way of, of motivating behaviors. So we're not just saying go exercise, we're really having a completely different approach. So we have this whole now standardized approach. We've been practicing this. We're, our, our launch date is October, uh, August 1st, but we as a group in Pittsburgh and in Washington University where uh, Eric Lintz is based are, are doing this uh, on practice runs with, with uh, patients. Uh, learning about this notion of personal goals interview, where we actually take these pictures that have been standardized that are really meant to highlight certain things that people may want to do. It has pictures with grandchildren, it has pictures of restaurants, it has pictures of walking, we have uh, pictures of people working, and we say, you know, what, what really if it is of interest to you? And we try to figure out what, how to prioritize that and how to link those goals to what we're going to do in cardiac rehab. So we stop talking about treadmill time. We don't talk about new step or weights. We talk about how do you get being able to go fishing with your grandchild again. 
and we try to characterize it in those ways. So it's really it's a rigorous process, and this this whole sense of fidelity and consistency, where we really have patients sort out what they want to do with pictures. We we really try to figure out what their values are in those pictures, and we try to make that an implementable part of what we try to do thereafter. Um, really trying to hone it down to, to key priorities that we can use, not to really be rigid about what those goals are, that you're, but to get closer to that sense of independence or that sense of capacity or, or self-confidence that, that we believe people really are trying to get to. And we've worked on you know, having sheets of, uh, uh, that we both use in different sites. And the two programs in Pittsburgh and St. Louis are very different from each other, but we have these components that are quite standardizable that we list the goals, we update these week to week about where the patient is. We kind of think the goals may change. Uh, and we talk about the integrated uh, aspects of cardiac rehab with being physically act active, uh, learning about what the, the issues are in their heart with their medications, talking about the, uh, the changes of the medications from hospital to home to try to help people stay uh, on track to their cardiac rehab goals. So that even if they're going to cardiac rehab in a program like at Vermont or anywhere else, that we're still supplementing it with these calls, we stay on track to goals. We don't assume this is part of cardiac rehab, this is a supplement on top of it, which is very behaviorally oriented. We call them coaching calls as part of what we do. So it's a very big pillar of our program. We, we can talk all about frailty, we can talk all about these other kind of physical outcomes and function and balance, but it's really, I think, uh, uh, propelled by the fact that people uh, hopefully will have buy-in you know, trying to get the, the buy-in to be on that treadmill or be on wherever, whatever activity they're doing because they're trying to get to their goal. And we really emphasize the follow-up each week. Are you getting closer to your goal? Reminding them what their goals are and trying, if we need to, if there's a learning impairment, a cognitive impairment, a literacy impairment of trying to integrate other people within the, the patient's uh, world to just maintain that enthusiasm and focus. So we, our preliminary work has been really strong. We're about to publish this, uh, or at least it's in review, I should say, I'm optimistic. That, but there's others have done stuff like this that show that the elements of frailty, however you mention it, and we've measured it in about six different ways with, with scoring sheets, the share score, the freed score. Uh, we've looked at it in terms of sits timed up and down and uh, uh, the uh, short form physical battery. But we see that, that, that frailty can be modified. And as you see here with the red lines, the, the benefits in terms of uh, it's better to be timed up and go, is it the lower the better? It's a measurement of walking and balance. Um, the frail people do the best with cardiac rehab, especially when it's infused by behavioral reinforcements. Six minute walking distance, the frail people do the best. And I think to me, where I am, that this, this notion of self efficacy, this goes back to this Bandora philosophy of what people really care about, this notion of self confidence, that they feel confident walking up a hill, they feel confident going to the supermarket. That goes up, again, in the frail people the most. If the people are the most impaired, they benefit relatively the most. And there's, as I mentioned, several other studies in Italy uh, and uh, most recently in Spain that have shown similar work that uh, the frail people, the, even in their 80s, 90s, stand to benefit. So we feel like we're, we're, we have a good context and we're really likely to benefit. I actually thought this was Jonathan Dean's picture. I was just told that maybe this was something he Googled. But it's really, to me, this is, a, I, Jonathan Bean is a, um, a physiatrist in Boston, but he talked about this as one of his patients, and he said that this was a, that this street at um, Coolidge Corner changed the timing of the light cycle, so that it went down eight seconds, you had eight seconds less to cross the street. And so for his patient, he, as he described her, maybe he was just being colorful, it's a great story, that she could no longer cross the street as confidently. And it changed her whole life. So I feel like, to me, this is like heroic. If you can change someone's self-confidence, capacity to walk gate speed, these are not abstract measurements. This is life for many people, their ability to get to where they want to go. And if you can't leave your house, your morbidity and your mortality skyrockets. So this notion of being really independent really is life-changing. And I feel like our macro endpoints are not necessarily cardiorespiratory fitness, but it's implicit. It's not just an abstract number. It's really, it, it's strength, aerobic balance in terms of capacity, self-efficacy, and it really lets people integrate with their lives to stay independent and to avoid the likelihood otherwise of rehospitalization. So I kind of believe it's heroic. I want to highlight that uh, the work I'm doing really in Pittsburgh, my career is essentially skyrocketed. This is an old slide. Um, this is work by Jerry Flegg at the NHLBI at the time. And he, he's looking at cardiorespiratory fitness a little bit more precisely. He's looking at the amount of oxygen you're breathing directly with cardiopulmonary exercise testing in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. Super healthy people, 
and over age. And he, there's two sets of lines, but one is actually uh, uh, longitudinal data. And we see a 10% decline of the VO2 per decade uh, is in association with aging. Powerful. And the work that's going on at the NIH now and in Pittsburgh and most of the world, it's informing this more and more with these principles of geroscience. This is not just that you're lazy, it's that, that you really no longer have certain capacities. In my case, I've been riveting on the mitochondria. What's happening to the mitochondria in all of our cells as one gets older? So it's not just behavior. I think behavior is always going to be relevant in terms of making people have the will, the desire to push themselves. But there is something that I really think it's, it's beneficial to tell this to my patients. It's not it's just in your head. Your body's different. So these are Baltimore longitudinal study. Same exact database, in this case, is looked at by Luigi Ferrucci, and he's showing changes to the mitochondrial respiration. This is the ability for the uh, mitochondria to use the oxygen to make ATP. And it's a similar relationship, you know, and, and these studies have been uh, correlated together, saying that this is really one of the powerful determinants of functional decline. So it's not just making people want to exercise more, that how do you address this? And so, as you heard, I, uh, since coming to Pittsburgh and kind of having this orientation, I've been surrounded by people who have been uh, thinking about how do you change mitochondria, how do you think about aging. So my chief of medicine is Mark Gladwin. He's one of the big nitrate mavens of the world. Um, and so nitrate is something very vital. We, you might have read about people drinking beetroot juice. It's a nitrate supplement, and it breaks down in our cells to nitric oxide, this kind of vital peptide. And as you see here in the graph, that nit nitric oxide has all these downstream effects in the mitochondria. It causes vasodilation, so that's one powerful uh, 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 endpoint. But it directly changes the mitochondria and their ability to increase respiration. So Mark Ladwin is a, is a pulmonologist, and I got to Pittsburgh. He was showing me data that he's doing this in pulmonary hypertension patients, and he was very excited about it. And I me immediately said, that's an aging drug, you know, <laughs> which he didn't think about at all. So we immediately, almost like the next week, started to look at it in sedentary uh, frail adults, and we all started to look at it in half pet patients with really very exciting outcomes so far. So bottom line, just to say that, you know, this novel thought about giving nitr nitrite pills. The, the, the breakdown to nitric oxide traditionally has been through arginine, through a, a, something you eat, and it breaks down through an oxidative pathway. If you take a nitrite pill, even more than nitrate juice, nitrate pills are abs directly absorbed into your body physiologically. You get high levels. Um, and uh, so we've, I'm sorry, I lost my picture here. It's funny. Um, so the, uh, we've been very excited about what, what we're, we're I'm sorry, just technologically having a, 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 an issue here. Uh, but, um, but the bottom line is that we've, we've shown efficacy, and I wanted just to highlight just briefly that some of the relationships we've seen that, which have led to our fun oh, thanks. Our funding have been very satisfying, that we showed that by giving the nitrite supplements for these older, frail populations, it led to very measurable changes in their ability to generate ATP for the amount of oxygen they breathe in. It's measured by this ratio, the LP ratio, the leak phosph ratio. So, and it was correlated, one of the more elegant measures we're looking at is the VO2, the amount of oxygen someone uses, at a steady state of exercise. And we showed there's a very significant decrease of the amount of VO2 for the same amount of exercise for people that are using nitrite. And so now we're looking at this in a much po larger population, and we're looking at this in association with how much physical activity people are doing in the community. And mice, when, when the mice are using nitrite, they increase their time on the uh, exercise wheel significantly. And we're hoping we can show the same thing in people. So this is another one of our R01 studies, another NIA study. And then the other point, I, I'm going to focus on one other thing. We have, I have three equivalent. This is a, a philanthropic-funded uh, uh, initiative. But it's really even more exciting to me. This is, again, looking at these pillars of what causes aging. And inflammation is one of the very big culprits of what we think causes a lot of things that are bad in old age. And so there's been lots of work, and I think probably some familiar to you, about inflammation having downstream effects on diseases. So many types of disease, cardiovascular disease, but all kinds of diseases can be uh, determined by the amount of inflammation in our bodies. But the other downstream effect, as I've said several times, is frailty and these other uh, age-related, uh, perhaps disease-independent phenomenon. And so what's, what's been common in the literature, I'm sure you've all heard of the Cantos trial. If not, I want to highlight that it's this, this Paul Ritker was the principal investigator. This is a huge trial published about it, uh, two years ago in the New England Journal looking at giving an anti-inflammatory drug, it's an anti-IL-1 drug, 
um, uh, and it had these downstream effects of reducing cardiovascular outcomes. People were recruited by having a high C-reactive protein, a high inflammatory state to begin with, uh, and it showed that by giving this anti-inflammatory drug, you had these benefits of uh, all these cardiovascular endpoints improvements. But in the same population, Dr. Ritker showed that also people had less cancer, and less, less incident cancer and less cancer mortality when they developed cancer. So again, it was going beyond, what, what's really exciting about this, in my opinion, is it goes beyond disease to something more, subs, more fundamental than diseases themselves as, as, as something that's really determined perhaps of multimorbidity can it be modified and so what we're doing now, again, with Beckwith Philanthropic Funds, working with um, really preeminent colleagues, Torin Finkel and Ann Newman, we're, we're looking at the ability to modify IL-6, uh, another uh, key uh, determinant of, of frailty and uh, uh, kind of uh, age-related uh, enfeeblements. Uh, and so we're looking at giving this over the course of a year and looking at changes that this VO2 at a, at a steady state. We're looking at body composition. And we're looking at a variety of measures of frailty and a placebo-controlled trial as, as a way of perhaps modifying disease in a very prevention-oriented, modifying aging in a very preventive-oriented fashion. So really speaking to the fact that we modify these elements of aging that go beyond disease for all of us and thinking about supplements perhaps to cardiac rehab, but ways of perhaps even avoiding the, the uh, disablements that might be uh, so um, important uh, in our outcomes of our older patients. And I want to just highlight certain points as we talk about statins. It's my last uh, theme of my, my talk. As I, as I mentioned, I was on the guidelines for statins. And I mentioned already several times my somewhat ambivalence about guidelines that um, many people who, who are on the guidelines committees are very passionate about caring for patients. And they think that by treating the disease very specifically, it's all going to be good. And I've said that multiple diseases make this much more complicated. So when we're dealing with a population that's older, that's so vulnerable to atherosclerotic disease, I want to emphasize, the, again, this notion that it's more than one disease. It's, it's the complexity of all these other elements. It's the associated vulnerability to falls and bleeding. So just getting the blood pressure down to the guidelines, just getting the statins on board may have bad uh, effects that are really not so great. Uh, especially in the face of limited life expectancy. And so I've watched lectures where I've had these wonderful, brilliant people, Barry Franklin, literally pounding the, the podium saying, statin, statin, statins. And I've really been very unsure whether he was right, because does it predispose to weakness, myalgias, cognitive declines? There's so many controversies that make me think it may not always be good. And now I'm on the guidelines, and I'm the voice of aging, and you heard all of my interests. So this is, this, these are the guidelines. So, and I, I take great responsibilities with, with Neil Stone, uh, who is the guidelines uh, co-chair, of really championing that there are, this is for primary prevention, for which the data are really somewhat wanting, but there are data. So how do you deal with that for trying to have a guidelines? So we acknowledge them with a 2B, considered somewhat weak, but still acknowledging that there may be a, 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 re a relevance for giving statins for an older population. For, we have data only up through the early 80s. So what do you do for your 90s? We really don't know. So 2B, weak. But in the same exact guideline, this is what I'm proud of, is that we talked about deprescribing. And there's palliative care literature by Gene Kuttner that says taking away statins for certain people can be very good, improve quality of life, improve function by taking away statins. So we made them equal. And I think this is the part that I've, and I think this really should be generalizable. I do not believe that we should have a 1A indication for blood pressure because there's too much complexity in older populations with, with blood pressure. And I think the notion that we have a 1A guideline for, uh, actually, I guess it's 2A for, for blood pressure is, 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 is um, a mistake. I think the real issue for almost every older patient should be 2B or not to be, no, no pun. And how do you, how do you really uh, do it? You have to look at the patient, examine the patient, and really come to your own best judgment based upon a clinical uh, thought process. For the statins, we also then try to inform this, and we, uh, the guidelines are permeated with this notion of using calcium scores. And there are good data up through age 80 that if someone has a calcium score that's zero, the benefits for a statin are really negligible, nil perhaps, so that uh, it really tries to help clinicians have a better thought process and not just do it based upon an emotional or a gestalt, but having a more elegant thought process. So I hope we can get to that with everything. 
who would be beneficiary for an anti-inflammatory drug? Who would be beneficiary, perhaps, for the nitrite pill? I think we have to have an elegant sense of where people are, what their body composition are, is, and what their goals of care are, and to really try to think about it in the ways that you're taking somebody who's not on a pill, you're adding a pill, you're doing it in a way that's in constant with their own motivations, capacities, and I think that's the way I, I kind of see us having to go in response to an older, complicated population. So with the um, statins, I'm really kind of happy to say this, that the work that we did in the guidelines, uh, I think, helped generate the, the funding for the, this big uh, trial, this the, uh, preventable trial. I'm pretty sure it's going to be funded. It has a very good score. Uh, there was an NIA uh, priority uh, to look at the use of primary care statins, uh, or statins for primary prevention in older populations, 70 and over. So this was uh, run by... Duke or, or, or championed by Duke Pitt, Pitt on the, uh, the PI and Pitt if it gets funded. Um, but it's a, it's a huge study, and it will focus particularly on issues of statins and cognition, statins and muscle, statins and frailty, statins and half path, and really trying to disentangle. It's a huge study if, if, it, if it gets funded as expected. But again, it speaks to this growing sense of recognition that we have to think about aging as one of the very big dimensions of care uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease and any other disease for that matter uh, in, with our current uh, demographic changes. So geriatric cardiology it really reflects uh, a time of shift uh, to, to match cardiology to, to better uh, respond to patient demographics. And cardiovascular disease, as I've said several times, I hope not too redundantly, is, is, is really different in the context of broader age-related complexity. Uh, I see function as really the priority that most people talk about as being important to them. In, in contrast to what we tend to think about as, as a cardiovascular culture, clean outcomes really don't mean much to my patients. They care about whether they're independent. And what does that mean? How many times do they have to go to the doctor? What are their anxieties? Those are things that I think are really important. And shared decisions are really important. It's easier said than done, especially with learning, uh, hearing, cognitive uh, limitations. Uh, there are novel therapeutic considerations that are coming on. They're going to hit you like gangbusters in the next 10 years because the pharmaceutical companies are all over this, and it's going to really change what we do. But I think the notion of motivation, the behavior, is all part of that. It's not just going to be a pill. Even in that big, big, big trial, the preventable trial, the people that wrote it in Duke, I think they still missed the boat. They think it's all about which pill, and I, they're really still missing the behavior of who's going to take the pill. If you give someone a nitrate, they still have to be active to have the nitrate effects perhaps work. We believe that it's not just taking a pill, it's taking the pill and then exercising with the pill. So we were trying to prove that and standardize it. So behavior is everything, I think, in terms of how these things are going to work and how do we do this for an older population. So thank you very much. Well, I think we need to do <laughs> well, well, I have two reactions. One is to kind of highlight that. So my career really changed. I was in Boston. As, as you heard, I, I was running the exercise lab. I was running cardiac rehab, which was a small program at the Brigham, really very modest program. Um, and then I started to get involved nationally 
with the ACC, starting a geriatric cardiology group. And the ACC leadership thought this was going to be tiny. They expected like 20 members. They thought it was fringe, weird, and they, but they were tolerant because they were trying to have members' value. They had this notion of member value. We, the first year, we had over 2,000 members. Suppressed everyone's expectations, and you just describe why. That, that was the consensus. We asked people why they, they wanted the answers, what to do for this overwhelming sense of challenge. So I think it, there's interest growing in terms of how to respond to this. And my interest remains, as you've heard, you know, rehab, because I think rather than rushing those people off to the cath lab, it would be great if you had the sense that even the most frail, complicated patients, you could have buy-in from family, they should all go to cardiac rehab, perhaps non-revascularized. For non-STEMIs, I feel like we do not know how to take care of non-STEMIs, in my opinion. We don't. AFib, we do not know how to take care of AFib. We do not know how to take care of HFPEF. I think in those three cases alone, cardiac rehab, one, two, and three. I mean, they, they should, it should be number. The guidelines don't make that clear as they could. They, they, I think we should really be, that, I see these as my opportunities of really trying, these are my themes to try to make cardiac rehab bigger in those populations and really focus it differently. Functional outcomes, quality outcomes, and have to have, every, but the problem that I have, which I suspect is true here, is that my colleagues, who I really, I value my colleagues, I don't feel uppity, I feel respectful, but they don't see it my way. I have to really be compelling to try to be convincing of them. They, Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. No, it's a sad course, and this is where palliative care does come in. But, but I do think opportunities probably are earlier, and we don't really know when those lines are. So I, but there are opportunities. For, and again, I, I go back to this all the time. It's, it's, these are not, this is mainstream medicine. You're saying this is flooding your, the wards upstairs. I mean, it's, it's so common, yet we don't, we're missing the boat on it. Uh, so there's opportunities. Yep. In terms of when I see cardiac rehab patients, I think our referring docs are just fine if, if I work with their blood pressure meds and their lipid pills. But if I start touching psychotropic meds and pain meds and GI meds and diabetes meds, they'll say, you know, I know that stuff better than you, and I put them on those meds and they should be on those meds. We probably would have to spend a lot of time on the phone to deal with a lot of that stuff. So again, I've mentioned Eric Lentz a couple of times. So he's a psychiatrist and has done this very successfully at Washington University. And I do think because he says he's a psychiatrist with expertise in deprescribing, he, he has a lot of clout. So people do listen to him. And I, do not, I will not have that. Yeah. So. so we're doing this all the time with the primary doctor. And I'm doing it in Pittsburgh with a, with a pharmacist. So we're trying to work as a team to try to uh, reinforce the, the, the rationale for the um, recommendation. But we are ultimately going to defer to the primary doctor. We, we can't yeah. change their management. It's remarkable. I don't know if you do any better, but it's remarkable how poor our medications are. The yeah. patients don't know what they're taking. Right. They're they don't. The medical assistant doesn't really get it right. You, know, you have one hand tied behind your back a lot. And to cut, just to, it's what you already implied, but the, the, the patient's understanding is the, it's the little yellow pill. You know, it's, it's not a, they don't know what they're taking. It's the little yellow pill. And, and, and the pills are always changing color because they're, they're, it's, they're all generics. So there's this confusion, compounding confusion, and the pills, there's, the size changes, the colors change. So it's, it, it really just adds to a tremendous sense of uh, uncertainty. And it leads to many rehospitalizations and all the associated impairments that go with rehospitalization. So it's really not innocuous, it's huge. Sorry? Can you come back? <laughs> I'd love to show our data when we have some data. <laughs> oh, I was.
<laughs> Thank you very much.